Today on Growing Through Grace. History, right? His story. I think you'll have enough to be able to go to history books and look them up. The point has to certainly be made when the past is accurately foretold, the future is easily believed for, right? God is sovereign. Listening to Growing Through Grace with Pastor Jack Abelin of Morningstar Christian Chapel in Whittier, California. Dare to Remember God is Sovereign. Well, that's the title of our current study, and we'll pick up where we left off last time in Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 through 35. God's purpose in showing these prophecies to Daniel is to assure him that the Lord was in control. God said it would come to pass, and it did. God really is in charge, and we can take great comfort in knowing that. So let's join our teacher for the conclusion of this message. Here's Pastor Jack. It is very much complementary to what the Antichrist will do when the church is taken out, and the Antichrist wins over the people, and then he turns on them and demands worship as God. So that's the example that God says, look, it happened in the past, I told you about it. It'll happen in the future so you can know about it and be confident in it. And that's really the purpose for lying these next to one another. Like I said, kings of the north, kings of the south. It refers to different rulers among the Seleucids and Ptolemies, depending on what time is being referenced. And it'll it'll help you to historically follow them through. Some of these, by the way, are easy to find. Others of them, the, the, the battles were smaller. The historical references for them are harder to find. But literally every battle referenced in this chapter can be found in a history book. So the effort will leave you with great overwhelming confidence. I remember the first time I taught Daniel, I spent three weeks tracking these all down. I went, oh, now I feel good about it. So you are challenged to do that. I'm not giving you my homework. You can go do your own. But just so you come away saying, yeah, I know who rules the world. And even if it takes 200 years for the Greeks to come to power, the angels are fighting, God is doing it, and he's in charge. And don't worry about what's coming up next because he's in charge. Nice to rest in his care, isn't it? Well, verse 5, Also the king of the south shall become strong as well as one of his princes. He'll gain power over him, have dominion. His dominion will be a great dominion. We know that Ptolemy I, he's from the south, was the early winner between this battle between these two titan kings while uh, Israel was stuck in the middle. So on your list of, of, I think, uh, the Ptolemies, he's probably the first one listed, right? 323 or so um, right. B.C. Verse 6, And at the end of some years, they shall join forces. For the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand. She shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who strengthened her in those times. Seems very confusing, doesn't it? You go, uh, read it again. Well, we know from history that Ptolemy II, again, you can look at your list, tried to make a peace agreement with Antiochus II later on in his life. And the way they thought to make this peace agreement was by having Bernice, the daughter of Ptolemy, marry this fella Antiochus II. But in order to marry her, Antiochus II, who's already married and had children, uh, was told he had to, d- to divorce his present wife named Laodis and to make sure that both sons would be illegitimate to the throne if he was to die. So the deal was, you know, political. Uh, you get rid of your wife. You can have my daughter. Get rid of those two boys. Make sure they're not on the list of, you know, descendants, if you will. And so that's what they did, except... By 246, Antiochus got tired of this whole idea. And so Antiochus left this woman, Bernice, and their little son, and they, he returned to live with his first wife, Laodice, who was, by the way, not happy for being treated like this, as you can well imagine. So when he came home, she poisoned him and killed him. 
while her friends in Antioch <laughs> murdered this woman Bernice and her infant child. And that's kind of was the end of the peace treaty that was established or sealed by marriage. So verse 6, there you have the reference to that. It took place in 246 B.C. Verse 7, but from a branch of her roots, one shall arise in his place, who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail, and he shall carry their gods away to Egypt with their princes and precious articles of silver and gold. He shall continue more years than the king of the north. And also the king of the north shall come to the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. So um, Bernice's brother, Ptolemy III, outraged at the treatment, of course, of his sister, pursued after Seleucus II now in your drawers or in your maps there for what his parents had done, captured him, subjugated him for a while, and all of the Syrians were kind of under, the prof you know, under his power. The prophecy here speaks about carrying an immense amount of booty back to Egypt and outlasting the king of the north by some four years, even as the Lord has said, this guy took 4,000 talents of gold, 40,000 talents of silver, 2,500 of these molten images, and he restored these idols back to Egypt from where they had been taken by the second king, a guy named Cambyses, who was a Persian king 300 years earlier. So there was a lot of movement, right, and a lot of, of battles. But, but how specific is this? He carries away their gods back to Egypt. He takes their articles of gold and silver. He outlives the king of the north. And indeed, it happened just that way. Uh, verse 9, interesting, because years later, a foolhardy Seleucus made an attempt to reinvade Egypt, and he about died doing it. He had to be turned back and to go back his own way. Verse 10, however, his sons, just down the line we go, shall stir up strife, assemble a multitude of great forces. One shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through, and then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. The, the next two sons of Seleucus II try to avenge their father's death and his humiliation. Seleucus III, he should be on your list there, died um, just three years later. But Antiochus III, also called Magnus or Great, spent the next 36 years of his life doing nothing but taking battles to the south. And that's exactly what we are told there in verse 10. Verse 11, And the king of the south will be moved with rage. He will go out and fight with him, the king of the north. They shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude will be given into the hands of his enemy. And when he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. Eventually, this showdown historically came between Antiochus III in the north and Ptolemy IV in the south, and they, they came to battle at a place called Raphia, R-A-P-H-I-A, Raphia. And Antiochus came with 70,000 men, big army, 5,000 cavalry, and they fought at Raphia, which was a border fortress in the south uh, near Egypt. Antiochus was defeated, but Ptolemy, a rather weak man, failed to follow through on his victory. He had won, but then he went, I guess we win. But, so he didn't do anything to put up defenses. He, he let these others regroup. And on his way out of the area, Ptolemy in pride ransacked Jerusalem, was turned away at the temple, which so angered him that when he got uh, home to Egypt, he had some 40,000 Jews living under his jurisdiction killed. And it's historically recorded here he took tens of thousands down, but he did not prevail. Verse 13, for the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former. He shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. And in those times, many shall rise up against the king of the south. Violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fail. And the king of the north shall come and build a siege mount, take a fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not be able to withstand him, even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist, but he who comes against him shall do according to his own will. No one shall stand against him. He shall stand in, uh, here's Israel, the glorious land with destruction in his power, and he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or be with him. Fourteen years later, Antiochus III returned to fight again against now 
Ptolemy V, who was on the throne, came with more troops. He brought with him many angry Jews who remembered how the Ptolemies had treated them earlier. And the south for a time fell into the hands of this king of the north. So the Jews would support the Antiochus's uh, attack, if you will, the third, but they would live to regret it because eventually Antiochus would make Jerusalem his base of operations. It would move all of his armies far closer to his enemy in the south. He's a lot closer to Egypt than he is from Syria. And so it, <laughs> Jerusalem became his home breeding ground, if you will. And Egypt had found a new power to look to, Rome. And so as Rome was coming up and Egypt was still fighting there in the south, um, Israel was in for a great difficulty. In fact, in verse 17, it talks about him setting his face to enter the, the strength of his whole kingdom. He, he resorted to diplomacy for a while. He, he offered it to his daughter Cleopatra to a very young Ptolemy V, uh, who was ruling on the throne. They got married, but the plan backfired as uh, Cleopatra decided to join her husband against her father. So that didn't work either. Well, finally, verse 18, 19, and 20, after this he shall turn his face to the coastlands. He'll take many, a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end. With the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. He shall turn his face towards the fortress of his own land. He shall stumble and fall and not be found. And there shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. We do know from history that Antiochus III left his plans for taking Egypt turned his ships back to attack the coastland of Asia Minor and Greece. The Romans, who were starting to look like a world power, came and came to the aid of the land, and uh, they defeated Antiochus. They threw him out of Greece. They annihilated his army. Verse 19, a few months later, he was crossing the eastern provinces when he was killed by a local inhabitant who caught him trying to plunder the temple of one of their gods. So verse 19, completely fulfilled. He stumbles and he falls and he isn't found. His vile son, verse 20, Seleucus IV, Philapter, the fellow there on your list before the Antiochus fellow that the Lord wants us to get to, um, followed. And for 12 years, he only tried to raise taxes to meet the demand for, from Rome for tribute. And he, said, he died, and most of historians say he was poisoned by his own treasure. He didn't die in anger. He didn't die in battle. He just got killed. And so... We come to the end of verse 20. His story, the history, right? His story. And like I said, I think you'll have enough in the handout to be able to go to history books and look them up. I don't know how, how accurate Wikipedia is with ancient history, but you can start there. And uh, the point has to certainly be made when the past is accurately foretold, the future is easily believed for, right? God is sovereign. Well, then we come to this rogue guy from Syria, these, these last few verses tonight, down to verse 35, which really focus on only one guy, Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, 175 to 163 B.C. He was a northern ruler in the Seleucids. He is in every place that he shows up a type of the Antichrist, and Daniel will jump to the Antichrist from this link in verse 36. Verse 21 of, says this of him, in his place shall arise a vile person to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. With the force of a flood they shall be swept away from before him and broken, and also the prince of the covenant, and after the league is made with him, he will act deceitfully, he will come up and become strong with a small number of people. Now, Antiochus was not the rightful heir to the throne. That should have gone to the fellow there in your list, Philapter. He had a son named Demetrius. But Antiochus did something really, well, political. He, he made a lot of friends, made a lot of deals, lots of deceit. And through flattery and through cunning, they said, well, rather than giving it to the rightful owner and, and the rightful descendant, we'll give it to you because you seem to have and, and hold great hopes for us as a people. And so we read in verse 24 that he shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province. He'll do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder and spoil and riches while devising his plan against the stronghold, but only for a time. 
So he was a crafty guy, this Antiochus Epiphany. We know from history that with a little help, he garnered a grassroots effort, and he won the support of the people by kind of playing Robin Hood. He stole from the rich, gave to the poor. Maybe you've heard of that before. He was an instant success. He believed absolutely in distribution of wealth. He soon invades the south, right, because that's what he wants, and he gets into Palestine as far as lower Egypt, and he rules with an iron hand. The guy, nice guy at home turns out to be just a vile guy out in the, in, in, in the real world. Verse 25 tells us that he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he can't stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Yet those who eat of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him. His army swept away. Many will fall down slain. And both of these kings' hearts will be bent upon evil. They shall speak lies at the same table. Sounds like foreign policy, doesn't it? But it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. So, look, both kings began to flatter one another. They met. They had council hearings. They, they, they had debates. <laughs> They, they all wanted to get the upper hand. They were liars and trickers, and Antiochus got the upper hand. And so, flush with victory, he goes home from the south to the north, but in order to get there, he's got to go through Jerusalem. And we read in verse 28, while returning to his land with great riches, his heart is moved against the holy covenant, and so he does damage, and then he returns to his own land. We know historically that flush with victory he, passing through Jerusalem, just harassed the Jews. They were really Switzerland, you know what I mean? <laughs> they, they didn't take sides. They were just stuck in the middle. And so in his cruelty, he, he took a pig into the temple. He sprinkled pig's blood over the entire area to defile it. He did so because, history tells us, he believed that the Jews had heard that he had been killed in battle, and when they heard that they had had a great party. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's what he was motivated by. Oh, you laughed when you thought I was dead. Well, I'm not dead. And he, passing through, put a great hurt upon them. Verse 29, at the appointed time, he'll return, again to go towards the south. But it won't be like the former or the latter times, for ships from Cyprus will come out against him. Therefore, he'll be grieved. He'll return in rage, where? Against the holy covenant, against Israel, and do damage. And so he shall return and shall regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. And forces shall be mustered by him. They shall defile the sanctuary fortress. They shall take away the daily sacrifices. And they shall place there the abomination of desolation. Now, historically, a few years later after this huge victory, Antiochus goes back to Egypt, back to fight with the southerners, if you will. And this time, rather than having great victory, they run into an army that is now fortified by Greek mercenaries and a Roman navy out of Cyprus. And so rather than winning, they're just getting annihilated. He comes all cocky and I can roll the world, and he finds that he can't do anything. And, and historically and publicly, he is humbled, he is humiliated, embarrassed, rebuffed. And so this time going home, he doesn't have any victory. He's got his tail between his legs, and he heads right for Jerusalem with a huge pride issue and anger problem and frustrated, and he comes to the weak Jews, and he takes it out on them. The defilement that we see here in verse 31 and 32 prefigure the Antichrist. In fact, from this point on, the term abomination of desolation refers first and foremost to what this guy did in the temple in Jerusalem, and second of all, what the Antichrist will do there in that day of his final rule. So, historically, Antiochus, verse 31, placed soldiers around the temple, the sanctuary fortress. He forcibly stopped the Jews from worshiping the Lord through their daily sacrifices. They went to, through the town, history tells us, and killed every child they could find. This guy was a wicked man. He made idolatry, idolatry mandatory. He took a, a, a statue of Zeus, put it right in the middle of the temple. He erected a, an altar to offer pigs. He made public nudity in the temple a practice. The guy was as filthy as you could possibly be. So 
he is the portrait of the Antichrist to come, right? The abomination that makes us stopping the sacrifice, demanding idolatry and worship and all. We read in verse 32, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, but it's in this context. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God, they shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Great promise. So, uh, in the context of these men defiling Israel, upset over their defeat at the hands, if you will, of the Ptolemies, supported by the navy of the Greeks and of the Romans, there was a group of men, we've listed them there for you, the Maccabeans, <laughs> Judas Maccabeus. He was uh, with a group of Hasmonean priests, and they began to fight a guerrilla-like war with this fellow Antiochus, eventually defeating him, reclaiming the temple miraculously as celebrated in the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. They took the temple back December 25th, um, 163 B.C. So when you have the Hanukkah, uh, or the Feast of Dedication, if you will, that, that's what they're celebrating, this deliverance, uh, by a few men, those of God who do great exploits over this wicked man. And then, you know, the story, the legend, if you will, of the oil that lasted, um, that's the story that's told whether that really happened or not. I don't know, but they certainly took the, the temple back. The cost of life, however, was staggering. Verse 33 says, And those of the people who understood will instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and by the flame, by captivity and plundering. And when they fall, they shall be aided with but little help, and many shall join with them by intrigue, and some of those of understanding will fall to refine them, to purify them, to make them wide until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. And so the Jews surviving again under attack, Daniel weeping over the future, is told, look, there's going to be other challenges to the people of God, but notice they will be sustained. Sometimes God will use it to cleanse them, to purify them, to, to get their alignment and their allegiance to be so... But, but God is working through it all. Now we're going to stop at verse 35 because verse 36 says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. And the king now goes from Antiochus to the Antichrist. And the last um, 11 verses here, 10 verses, and I think the first three verses of chapter 12 look forward to that time. And I'd, want to, I'd rather spend that evening with you looking specifically at those things. Here's what you want to remember. I know you have, I've confused you a lot. Um, or if not, at least you're, 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 you're wondering where I came from. Be encouraged. That's really God's word to Daniel. Be encouraged that God is in charge. If you look at history, you, you will probably come up with the fact that the Jews could have been wasted hundreds of times. Right? 50,000 Jews were killed in Seleucia. 20,000 died in Caesarea when the Syrians came to power. Antiochus killed 80,000 Jews took 40,000 prisoners, sold 40,000 as slaves. When Titus, the Roman army, rolled into Jerusalem in 70 AD, they killed 1.3 million Jews. There are always the Jews, aren't there, being attacked. Constantine turned on them as well, driving them into the frontier. The rise of Islam in the Arabia Peninsula in 633 AD led to the deaths of tens of thousands of Jews, most Islamic practicing, at least in the Mideast, would like to see the Jews wiped out. I should just tell you that's not going to happen. Why? Daniel 11. God said he's going to take care of the Jews. Thank you, Pastor Jack, for that perspective on the future and the things that we should pay attention to in our day. We've been listening to a study taken from Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 through 35. This has been the second half and conclusion of a two-part study taught by Pastor Jack Abelin. If you'd like to get the entire message, we do have that available for you. All you need to do to order is simply contact us and ask for study number 1535. It's always helpful for us to know the radio station that you're listening to, so be sure to mention those call letters when you get a hold of us. And as we're studying through the book of Daniel, you may realize that perhaps no one in the Bible possessed a more resolute faith in God than Daniel and his peers, who never took the easy way out, but stood their ground even in the face of death. Now, there's lots to be learned from Daniel about his unshakable faith. And as a respected Bible teacher, Warren Wearsby unfolds both the explicit and implicit teachings from this account of Daniel's in his book that's titled, Be Resolute. 
In this book, Warren Wearsby takes the example of Daniel and his peers to help all of us to a more practical and resolute faith. So if you'd like to order Be Resolute by Warren Wearsby or to get today's study, just dial our toll-free phone number at 866-88-GRACE. That's 866-884-7223. Or you can order by mail. Just address your letter to Growing Through Grace, P.O. Box 1954, Whittier, California, 90609. And as always, this and all of our resources are available online at growingthroughgrace.com. That's growingthroughgrace.com. And that's going to wrap up our time together today. We do thank you for being with us. So until next time, as you daily walk with our Lord Jesus Christ, may you continue to grow in His grace. Growing Through Grace is a listener-supported ministry brought to you by Morningstar Christian Chapel in Whittier, California, a Calvary Chapel outreach.